I made sure not to go out today at all because yeah. this city is the fucking worst, but it's also really bad on St. Patrick's Day. Sure. That's why I went to go get my beer for the celebration this evening yesterday. Mm. The celebration of heaven and how it is for real? Yeah. yeah. Or the is there another of, celebration you're going to after this? The celebration of <clears throat> working all damn day and then coming home recording podcasts is what I'm celebrating. Hell yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah. It's a St. Patrick's Day tradition. Yeah, That's with right. the the love of the Irish being what it is, you're you're drinking a a Guinness. You would think so, but I went to the uh, grocery store and I tried to get a Guinness. Uh-huh. No Guinness. Yeah. Tried to get a Smithick. No Smithick. No Harp. Oh, mm. you are late oh, to the hard. game. I certainly was. So I got the they smoked you out. I got the fourth most Irish beer on earth. Red Stripe. <laughs> hmm. hmm. It's it's beer. Hooray, beer. Is that the tagline? Beer. I love that fucking commercial that rocks. But I'm not doing the voice. Oh, I kind of did the voice. I like backed off. I did like half right the voice. Now. <laughs> so many possible worlds, but we got this one. So many possible worlds, but we got this one. Welcome to the worst of all possible worlds. The podcast that sometimes does the voice. Now, I'm the worst of all possible Brian's. <laughs> I'm the worst of all possible Josh's. And, and sadly, AJ cannot be here today because yeah, as no, he's he been, is. Actually, I just got news from AJ. Uh, he's actually been extradited to Egypt on charges of tax fraud. Whoa. So more to come on that later, I guess. But uh, <laughs> we can't be more specific about these charges at this time. Mm. Rest assured, we're all doing the best that we can to get him out of there. But yeah. it's touch and go. So in the meantime, uh, we have joining us in his stead two esteemed podcasters. They've co-hosted Radio Free Tote Bag since 2018. They are returning champions on our show, having last joined us to talk about Fireproof in episode 102. Please welcome back Audrey and Donovan. I'm sick of this! <laughs> Thank you, Kirk Cameron. Gone on you with the pick and roll. Young LaFlame, he in burpo mode. <laughs> did you bring bars? No way did you bring bars. I just want to get it out of my system at the top. I'm going to be saying burpo quite a lot because <laughs> this motherfucker's name is Burpo. Yeah, we're, uh, we're, we're, we're here today to talk about a media property that got some crossover into the mainstream, mostly on account of the main character being a real person named Colton Burpo. Uh, we are, of course, talking about the account of re- going to heaven and returning back to this earthly plane. Heaven is for real, for specifically real. the movie, uh, which was released in 2014. This movie is based on a book with one of the worst covers I've ever seen in my entire life. Yeah. It's just this little yellow book. And you see from a very high angle, this picture of a child with an atrocious five head. I'm sorry, we'll go into it later. It's fine. I had, I I was very similar. I was a bulbously skulled child myself. And and he's wearing Swedish physiognomy. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, it's weird. It's like, I had to look up the name Burpo. It's like, is this some long lost like Swedish last name? No, it's French. And he's wearing, I don't even know how to describe it. UX. (laughs) <laughs> he's like wearing an adult jersey. He's just like he looks like a flying squirrel with the again with the five head. Right. It's not yeah. it's not the kid's fault. It's just it's a bad cover. No, it's not good. And Audrey and Donovan, uh, I reached out to both of you because Donna, we've been going back and forth for a little while just about Burpo. I think you've been Burpo pilled for a bit. Uh, and I'd be curious to hear up until now. What was your exposure to heaven is for real? Had you seen the movie? Had you read the book? Or you just sort of heard about it in broad strokes. I will be honest with you. I don't know how this happened. There was just a day where I was like, Colton Burpo. <laughs> I remember this. You mentioned it what on the, the show. I want to say like years ago. I think I did. And I like just messaged a few people and said, Colton Burpo. And they were like, what the fuck are you talking about? And then I was like, what am I talking about? Where did I even get this from? And I looked it up and it was like the, the boy who lived basically. And yeah. his story and, and all of this. Yeah, I, I had no idea who it was. I, I literally just thought it was a very funny name because it's, <laughs> it's a very funny name. I don't know really? how it got in my head, though, and I'm glad I have now found out. Every every one of the Burpos is just fun to say. You've got Todd Burpo. <laughs> There's Cassie Burpo. Cassie Burpo. There's the, the third Burpo child, Colby Burpo. 
Colby, and then, and Colby, Colby Burpo. Burpo. The Burpy one Burpo. that has stuck in my head the most out of all of them, and Josh can attest to this, is the wife. Yes. Sonia. Sonia Burpo. She's a fighting game character. Sonia like, Burpo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sonia Burpo. She chose this name. <laughs> she chose to do this. She, yeah. she made a decision in her life to become Sonia Burpo. Well, do you want to be like Sonia Jorgensen Burpo? Like, if you're going to take any of them, you got to fucking pull it off. You got to really burp it up. Audrey, are, are you, were you, did you have any passing familiarity with the Burpos or I was this say, Terra Nova for you? I want to say I heard about it on Dr. Phil because my folks oh. were on a big Dr. Phil kick for a long time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I would come yeah. home yeah. from uh, wherever the fuck I went out with my folks for a long time, but I come home. Yeah. They're watching Dr. Phil and I am confronted by Burpo. <laughs> right. I'm like, what's up with this Burpo? What the fuck? And they're like, oh yeah, like, he almost died. He went to heaven. I'm like, oh, do you mean that? Do you mean that literally, mother? She's like, yeah, yeah. He went to heaven. He saw Jesus. I don't see what's wrong. And that's sort of where it began and ended, or did she become yeah. burpo pilled? She did not get burpo pilled, but she okay. uh, <laughs> she didn't get burped up. <laughs> she didn't get she didn't get particularly burpy. Um, she was just you know like. Like I feel the message of the movie really is she was just kind of inspired by the story for sure. a time, you know? Sure. Yeah. Doesn't matter if it was kind literal of, or not, you know? Yeah. That, that, and that's kind of what this is, right? This is in the great tradition of inspirational stories that a grandma or whatever or a yeah. mom or can, can look at and be like, oh, that's nice. That, that's kind <laughs> of what this is yeah. at its core. And I, I think most people who have heard the general outline of the story pretty much just know it as there was a kid he briefly died he went to heaven he had a vision of heaven he came back to earth he told his dad about it case closed and Mm -hmm. so we kind of dug into it for this it turns out that not only is the story itself much much weirder than that so too is the real life story around how this thing came to exist as well as how it changed the life of the burpo family (laughs) Uh, you know, in in the years following the book's release, and then of course the movie's release. Yeah. Damn, what a tease! Everyone's all <laughs> everyone's all amped to hear about Burpo now. <laughs> everyone's talking about Burpo. <laughs> yeah, I mean, of course, obviously, there's a long, long stretch of human history of people having visions of a plane of existence beyond our own. That's not what we're so interested in here today. Although, of course, this is this is the subject at hand. We wouldn't really have any image of afterlives as they're conceived without some mystic or priest or prophet along the way saying, oh, yes, I did see where we're going to go after we die. You can see it in uh, Tibetan literature. You can see it in Egyptian literature. You can see it in the Epic of Gilgamesh, where everyone just lives in a big house and they all are made out of dirt and everything is dirt. And uh, of course, we have it in Christianity. Most Forms of Christian belief are built more on devotion rather than proof, Mm. right? There's there's less about personal experience than there is about using your existence in the world as we know it to ascertain sort of the presence of of God within it, right? Josh comes from an especially strong a tradition of that Calvinism yeah. is entirely about like you can just find God by like studying science. Yeah. I mean, and then that's kind of the idea behind reformed Christianity, right? Is is yeah. the idea that all all nature speaks to the majesty of God's creation. Right. And so you can go out there and you can be a fucking biologist and you can sequence DNA in the fact that DNA can be sequenced and is this code to all of life. Well, that is proof of God's creation and yeah. proof that there's a God that loves order in an order that underlies everything. And I think that's not necessarily what I believe, but I do think there is a power to that. Yeah. And there's particularly a power to the fact that the, these are all things that are rational and explicable in their own way. Yeah. But just because of that, it doesn't mean that there aren't also underlying spiritual components to those things. And when we look at the history of Christianity, we're, we're primarily focusing on Europe and, and people who are living within the kingdom of heaven. Right. There are people who are within ca- uh, Catholicism or people who have reformed Christianity like Luther or whatever. But there's not any point where you're having to prove that the spirit realm exists, that Christianity exists is correct over something else but now as we get into modernity 
the religion starts to shift because we start colonizing other places. We have Europeans coming to America and meeting people who have absolutely no familiarity with Christianity or anything resembling it. And and especially once you have people moving and settling and having children and having that further and further disconnect from Christendom, Christianity itself starts to shift. Even within Europe, you get people like Swedenborg who was this mystic who had these great visions and everything. Come yeah, on. Right? Here's a guy, a Swedish guy who's just named like Jim Swedish guy. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to go with a, uh, uh, you will be assimilated. Resistance is futile kind of thing. Also good. Yes. 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 Yeah, he's a Swedish Borg. It's um, the big cube, but it's blue and yellow. It's got a <laughs> yellow cross on it. <laughs> And so a guy who's kind of in the middle of these two sorts of things, right? Lots of reasoning and science and theology, but also a vast curiosity in the spirit realm, in dreams and visions, is a guy named John Wesley. And John Wesley is the founder of Methodism. He's this guy who lives, he's, he's British, he lives in the 1700s. He comes over to America, though, for a little while. Um, he had dreams of his own. He, he's, he talked frequently about having been in the presence of ghosts who he always believed that like somehow Christians could make their presence known after death. Sometimes they would appear to people immediately upon the night that they die in their dreams, like appear to their wife or, or something like that. Sensations of just like good feelings sort of passing through you. Or people having dreams that presage their own death just a week or so before they go. It's worth noting, by the way, that in a lot of more conservative sort of branches of Christianity and especially evangelical Christianity, these sorts of things are seen as basically heretical, right? Yeah. Where the idea is if you're like being visited by some sort of a presence or a spirit, that's actually just straight up from Satan. Yeah, that's a deep Like, dog. don't fuck with that. Yeah, exactly. P particularly stories in modernity would come up, like, you know, things from our era would come up, and my mm -hmm. mother would kind of be like, that's nice. How nice is it that the little boy <laughs> yeah, saw yeah. You know? And uh, <laughs> there was some, like, my mother had some, like, pretty wild supernatural beliefs about how she would get feelings about things or when people she was close to would get injured or have oh, something okay. go wrong, she could like feel it, she would say. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, okay. Yeah, sure thing. But then I've experienced some of that too. Where you like you feel you have like a weird feeling, and then you call the person and they're like, Oh my god, I'm so glad you called me. This thing just happened and mm -hmm. it sucks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you're like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> what happened here? Yeah, yeah. The Lord has impressed upon you. Yeah. yeah. Somehow something impressed upon me, probably. No, it's the Lord. It's it's Jesus. It's God, the father. It's the Holy yeah, Spirit. Yeah, 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 mm -hmm. yeah. You'll you'll get there. You'll figure it out. Um, so <laughs> what, what, what about you, Donovan? Jesus confirmed. It was it was, it was around. Uh, yeah. So grew up Catholic, went to Catholic school. Like, I remember my mom talking about that kind of thing. Just like having a, you know, a feeling that something mm -hmm. happened. And I remember I had a couple of times as a kid and the details are kind of foggy. I hadn't really thought about this in a long time until just now. Mm. Uh, we're like, I had a feeling somebody was going to die or something. And then we get a call and they died. But like, there's like a great aunt is the thing I'm thinking of. Who's like old. And I feel like was sick already. So I don't know. I like, I yeah. definitely remember believing that though, or being like something, something's going on as a kid, but that wasn't yeah. like, I wasn't around a whole lot within my family. I will say a Catholic school in suburban Ohio this is probably seventh grade. Uh, my religion teacher, we love religion class. Talk about the yeah. Bible. Talk about the history of religion. Ask a question. Uh, get day, yelled up. Get <laughs> yelled up if you question it. <laughs> one day we all, we all go into class. And this is something else I haven't thought about in forever that just entered my mind. This teacher did an entire class period talking about the time that her house was haunted. What? <laughs> <laughs> and how like objects moved and like the piano played itself and all yes. of this stuff. Your teacher had a poltergeist? She full on, this was an entire day of class. Oh, I need to text rocks. my friend about this <laughs> and to see what details he remembers because I forgot about this. An entire class she <laughs> talked about living in this house. I just remember objects floating and getting like woken up in the middle That's of the awesome. night. 
the piano yeah. playing itself, like Scooby Doo kind of shit. Yeah. <laughs> and this was a whole, this was a whole fucking class. And I yeah. remember, like, I I believed it. I was like, this is the craziest shit I've ever heard, and this is my religion teacher. Yeah. So this is this has to be true. But <laughs> Much like heaven heresy. in that That's regard. Crazy. Yeah. 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 Guys for real. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think in Catholicism, it's like you can kind of just accept it. Maybe there's sometimes it's like, well, see, that guy prayed the rosary that morning and when he got shot, the bullet got stopped or something. But it's usually yeah. not so much like, oh, we got to prove Jesus is real for this and that reason or that this person is saved. That has to be proven. That's already kind of like, yeah, we got it. God made this whole thing. We got priests. It's all it's all figured out with when you get more evangelical and if you go fully into Pentecostalism, mm-hmm. the proof is not just about proving the existence of God to other people, but also uh, an experiential proof that you are saved by feeling the Holy Spirit come upon you in some way. And you will prophesy, speak in tongues, be healed or heal others. Right. Um, place your hands on someone. They don't have asthma anymore. Awesome. See, God is is right there. He exists. <laughs> Um, this was a debate I'd always get into with some Pentecostal kid that was in my class. He was homeschooled and struggled a lot, and then he ended up dropping out of school. Oh, uh, but, no. Uh, Fuck that yeah. guy. That's but miserable. he always... <laughs> Fuck that guy. Wow. Yeah. Wow. No, no honestly, damn. no. Eric, you were a problem child. <laughs> anyway. Uh, if you're listening to this, Eric... Fuck you. <laughs> I'm going to steal your lunch money, Eric. I'm coming to your house right now. <laughs> I want to be nice so, to Eric. But he okay. talked about like, yeah, you're not really <laughs> saved unless you've, you know, uh, spoken in tongues or, you know, you're not really saved if you're wearing shorts or stuff like that. So, again, yeah, fuck Eric. Stupid <laughs> asshole. Let me get a couple shorts more of these wearing beers little me. I'm going to be talking bitch. in tongues. Damn. Just <laughs> flat out one of the dumbest people I've ever known wow. in my entire life. So I feel wow. like I'm kicking him while he was down. But like <laughs> he, his parents did not set him up for success. You're going to be uh, they speaking did... tongues when I'm flushing the toilet with your head in it, Eric. <laughs> there we go. Ow. Got him. <laughs> so John Wesley, again, is like at the middle of that. And and he and Methodism is something that I, I don't have enough familiarity with, but it can sort of veer everywhere from being basically wasp shit to literally Oral Roberts. So it can have that faith healing. It can have that that spirit of revival it can have that constant look for proof. And Wesley himself, when he came to the United States, specifically did so as a kind of anthropologist interviewing uh, Native American people yeah. that he met and asking them about their experiences with spiritual visions because he was trying to compile possible proofs to see if the same universal truth of God and Jesus Christ that he, as he understood it, was underlying those same visions as well. Interesting. He was a that's, very fascinating man. That's really, that's really where my mom is. She's trying to synthesize all religions to match into yeah. Christianity somehow. That's, mm-hmm. what she, that's what she lived by. Anyway, this isn't about the spirit realm. This is about publishing. So yes. <laughs> let's get let's, to the 20th let's century sell some here. some fucking books. <laughs> because... <laughs> the the books about I went to heaven. Here's me. I'm let's say Dan Crumbo, and I I died, and some shit happened, and then I saw Jesus, and maybe also Satan. Is kind of a new thing, right? No one really thought like Dante actually went to hell in heaven. Mm-hmm. He was just he was he doing some stuff. No, uh, sorry, Josh. No, <laughs> he's just riffing. So. This starts, at least uh, what I want to look at, starts with a guy named George Ritchie. In 1943, George Ritchie is in boot camp and he suffers uh, from a terrible infection. I saw pneumonia on one count. I also saw perhaps it was a, a, a an acute influenza infection. Ooh. Strep throat. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <Tell Right? me. laughs> COVID-19. And so. So he is like unconscious and they can't catch any vitals off of him or anything. And he has this experience, an out of body experience. He sees himself. He also kind of flies over the land. It gets even more elaborate. He starts to see uh, Jesus meets him and he, he sees like demons all over the place that are like the embodiments of people's cigarette addictions. Wow. Like clinging to people, he start. He basically envisions a world that's very much like 
David Lynch's, you know, fire walk with me kind of stuff. Mm. Or a little bit Frank Peretti with the little, demons oh, of, of temptation, like gripping onto you or whatever. Uh, I wouldn't Perhaps be shocked if Neil Gaiman with the, yeah. with yeah. the old Sandman. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I wouldn't be shocked if, if Frank Peretti is familiar with George Ritchie's story. I'm just so, picturing some yeah. poor motherfucker walking around with Joe Camel on his shoulders <laughs> like they're playing chicken. <laughs> it's like, fuck, that's got to be exhausting. It's really, it's really dragging him down. <laughs> That's a big camel. That's like, that a really big, big camel. camel. He's a big dude. He looks sick, though. He's, just, he's killing it. As a child, I am just overcome with the desire to purchase cigarettes thanks to that enormous camel. <laughs> yeah, I've got the Marlboro man just lassoing me all the time. <laughs> so George Ritchie, he, he gets better. Um, he After World War II, he uh, becomes a psychiatrist. And he kind of tells people this story. This is just a thing that he likes to talk about with people. He doesn't do any kind of scientific research into any of this, which I think is interesting. But it's just like this thing that happened to him that really impacted him personally. In 1965, we have a psych student named Raymond Moody. No relation for our, for the believers in our audience. No relation to the Moody's like Moody Bible Institute, anything like that. It's just some or guy. electronic music artist Moody Man. Well, he might be. I didn't check. So <laughs> he actually, actually, no, that's true. He actually is. I just, I just, uh, I just confirmed it. Just Google it. <laughs> yeah. Moody Man related Big to Detroit weird guy, religious yeah. dude? Question mark. <laughs> so Ray, yeah. So Raymond Moody hears George Ritchie's story, and he's like, "This is, this is what? This is fucking crazy." And he digs into it this becomes like his life's work now yep. um so after 1965 he starts studying and collecting stories um of people having these experiences of, of leaving their body of what they feel when when their vitals go away or when they're under anesthesia or whatever moody coins the term near-death experience mm. which are also referred to as ndes for people who are in the community um <laughs> He publishes the community. Yeah. <laughs> you think anyone out there no. like chasing near death? You know what I mean? Like I'm trying to almost get killed so I can meet Jesus. <laughs> here's, here's the thing. Kind of. Um, oh, so <laughs> <laughs> seems bad. Uh, so in 1975, Moody publishes this book, Life After Life. I'm making the world's biggest <laughs> jack off motion right okay. now. <laughs> Fuck you. So he identifies hallmarks of near death experiences involving all the things that you know of. Right. You feel a, a, a sense of peace. You hear like an ambient sound or perhaps music. You can see your own body. There's a light in a tunnel. Oftentimes the psychopomp be it Jesus or whoever says it's not yet your time and brings you back to your body. Hmm. Uh, all that kind of stuff and more. But this, this becomes sort of the basic framework. We all, the phrase near death experience doesn't even ring a bell as like a specific kind of term. It's like, Oh yeah, it's an experience where you nearly die. Everyone kind of accepts this, even though yeah. the, the scientific rigor of this is a little funny. Uh, Raymond Moody also really gets into past life regression stuff and nice. uh, awesome. uh, scrying, like looking through a mirror and trying to, you know, <laughs> total, total like hippie <laughs> fucking, you know, Maharishi kind of shit. No, that shit rocks. I mean, it was the mid 70s. Yeah. Like it was yeah. the style at the time. This book <laughs> is published by Mockingbird Press, which is not a Christian publisher. Oh, OK. Right? In 1978, because of the success of Life After Life and the discussions about the afterlife um george ritchie himself the original guy with the nde he publishes his story that book is called return from tomorrow uh, it sounds like a star trek episode it sounds like a yeah. fucking tom yeah. cruise movie <laughs> that too <laughs> so this book is published by fleming revel revel is a small illinois-based a religious publisher. A lot of these companies started in Illinois and a great number of them moved to Colorado Springs. F and Fleming Revell was founded by Dwight Moody. Again, no relation. Fleming Revell is now owned by Baker Publishing in Grand Rapids, I Michigan. I love the Baker, the Baker book house. Yes. Yeah, dude. Yes. <laughs> this is totally inscrutable to anybody yeah. who's not from Grand Rapids. Let's keep it moving. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hey there, you are listening to a preview of a premium episode of The Worst of All Possible Worlds. If you'd like to listen to the rest of this, head on over to our Patreon. That's patreon.com slash worst of all. And you can listen to not only the rest of this episode, but our entire backlog of premium episodes, 
bonus episodes, and if you subscribe at the $10 tier, you will get an extra episode of the podcast every single month. Again, that is patreon.com slash worst of all. Hope to see you there.